Before a year, Kay Gilderdale believed she could go to prison for the attempted murder of her own daughter. And then last week, a court cleared her, the judge agreeing that she was just a loving mum trying to do the best for her sick child. The cheers of her relatives may have died down, but the debate around this case has not. If out of love and dedication, Kay helped her own daughter commit suicide, should the law take action against her? or not. This is the home in East Sussex where Kay and her daughter lived. Now she has only Lynn's belongings. These are clothes that Lynn chose from catalogues. It's the odd thing that I just bought her when, when I was out, but most of them she she chose for when she was better. Christ, that one. Kay lives on memories of the daughter she loved. She had quite a strong personality and she was very popular. She'd come home from school, you know, bursting to tell you everything that was going on. And happy child? Happy child, yeah. She loved sailing, loved swimming. She loved music and dancing. You know, she was interested in everything, really. And despite everything that's happened, I'm imagining you can picture that quite vividly. I um, have very strong pictures of her. I see her running, because she was a great runner as well, you know, and striding out, and I just catch all the things in my head of when she was able to do all that. We were all very active, and we all spent a lot of time outside. We spent a lot of time on the beach here, and uh, it was really the time before Lynn got ill, uh, where we were very happy, and. We did normal family stuff. Living by the sea, a loving and healthy family. Kay, the auxiliary nurse. Husband Richard, a policeman. No clue of what was about to happen. We used to sit on the beach here and look at uh, Lynn and her brother enjoying themselves and thinking how lucky we were to have uh, such fit and healthy children. It's very difficult to describe how I feel now. I look around and um, I'm going to see her everywhere, really. Yeah, it was where she was free, <coughs> free, and uh, before she knew what pain was and, and hospitals and sickness. Lynn was 14 when everything changed, and the start of it was so mundane. There was a call from the school to go and collect her that afternoon because she wasn't very well. Tried to send her back again the next day. She's sent home sick again. The th third day, we send her and she's sent home sick again. And she just wasn't able to go anymore after that. Very quickly, she got the flu. Then she got bronchitis, tonsillitis, um, glandular fever, chest infections again. And you're beginning to realise then there's something wrong, that it wasn't just an ordinary illness. Lynn had fallen ill in 1991. She was diagnosed with a severe form of ME, which attacked her body relentlessly. By May, she was in a wheelchair. Her voice had gone to a whisper. She was diff having difficulty swallowing. She couldn't remember people or things or places. A sort of a physical destruction in a way. Yes, yeah. Then we realised that nobody had the answer. There wasn't a magic cure. This is Lynn in her sickbed. She was filmed for a documentary on ME, which showed how, from her 15th birthday, she was paralysed from the waist down and could only be fed through a tube. It was a conscious decision that I was going to look after, and I told her many times, for as long as it takes, I'll be here, I'll look after Did you. Did she then worry about what she was doing to your life. Yeah, she said that on occasions, but um, she wasn't difficult to look after. She didn't complain. She might lie and cry in pain sometimes, but she didn't complain. And in fact, I, I was honoured to spend so much time with her. She was a wonderful person because she was so determined. She was very, very strong. She was a real fighter. But her body was giving up. Over 16 years, she would be in hospital 50 times with a succession of serious illnesses. How's that, Lynn? It's all right. I feel better once you have something in your tongue. Hey. K 
Kay was there constantly for her daughter, but so was the pain. They both lived on hope. One day, Lynn would recover. She was such a beautiful girl, I could imagine her looking absolutely stunning in something like that. Yes. She was going to make up for the time that she's lost and so shy. Well, was the time she never had. Yeah, yeah, but she was hoping that she would be the young mm. woman mm. going out to occasions mm. to, um, to uh, wear the stuff. Mm. Yeah. Did you feel, though, watching her at some point, you maybe were ahead of her thinking, I don't know how to tell you this, but that I don't think this is beatable. Yeah. Say whatever is causing the Emmy goes away. She's now left with all these very, very significant conditions. And she had osteoporosis with 50% bone loss. She had broken bones just by being moved. Total adrenal failure, ongoing anemia, liver dysfunction, hypothalamic dysfunction. You've given, a, you've given a list there, which is... is enough to end it. Premature ovarian failure. So, but, yeah. so, well, I mean, even that on its own is, was a signal to her she would never have children. She got to the point herself that she said, I'm too broken, you can't fix me anymore. She felt her only escape was to die. And she tried to break free in May 2007, attempting suicide. She mentioned on several occasions that she did not want to carry on the way she was. She did make it aware that she wanted to end her life, yes. She was a very intelligent girl who knew exactly what she wanted to do and what had to be done. So. However painful for her brother and parents, there was no doubting Lynn's wish to die. She had painstakingly written her own online journal. My body and mind is broken. I am so desperate to end the never-ending carousel of pain and suffering. I have nothing left, and I am spent. You're torn apart because you've got one party wanting to respect your daughter's wishes, and you've got your heart being ripped out at the same time because because all you want to do is make them better and keep them alive. At what point did you realize that not only were you prepared for her to go, but you were actually prepared to help? I knew I'd be prepared to take her to Switzerland. However, I did it. I don't know how I would get her there, but I knew I would be prepared to try and get her there. But there's no way that I could know how I would react in the situation I found myself in. Lynn couldn't wait for Switzerland. In December 2008, she took a massive dose of morphine. When I first met Kay, we didn't talk about the events of that night. On our second meeting, she was ready to. She held it up to show me, and there was about a third left of the whole dose. I just sat beside her and said, you know, what are you doing? So you talked to her? Yes. I tried to um, dissuade her, and she, in, she asked me, um, pleaded with me to, to help her to get more morphine. So I went and uh, got the morphine and took it into her, and I saw the look of determination, like she psyched herself up and, you know, really, I have to do this. She took the last two syringes that I gave her, and she wouldn't let me go near them. She obviously knew that she had to do it. And she pressed the plunges. And just as she did, the lights went out in the house. One of the circuits went out. I said, wait, because my heart was wanting her to stay. And she, she said no and um, continued to push the plunger. And she went unconscious straight away. Her last words to you were what? Her last words were, She's frightened, and uh, I thought she meant she was frightened of the unknown. And I said, why are you frightened? And she said, I'm frightened for you, and I'm frightened it won't work. <laughs>